So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lydia Chu. I'm one of the organizers. And um, this year, our company has had a lot of inquiries about ADA compliance and um, whether it's on the side of a company coming us from help for help, remediating after they've been um, served a lawsuit, or somebody, people who want to be proactive about um, having their sites be compliant. And a couple of different attorneys in the LA area where I'm from said, well, if you're interested in actually um, getting some really good advice, you have to talk to Michelle Landis at Accessible 360. And, <laughs> and that's, how, that's how we met. And I was um, thrilled to find out that they were actually in Minneapolis where we happened to be having this conference. And I was thrilled that she was going to be able to, to, to speak. Her company um, specializes, she's a founder and CRO of Accessible 360, and they specialize in helping businesses with accessibility audits, I mean, pretty much anything having to do with website accessibility. And so please give her a warm welcome. I'll turn it over to her. Yeah. Thank you. So hopefully you can hear me and it's not too loud. I'm a walker, so if you sit in the back, I'll probably still be making eye contact with you. Is this my clicker? Um, I'd love one if you have one, um, but no worries. Otherwise, I can adapt. I don't know what that controls. We'll just leave that here. Maybe that was from the last guy. Um, so, well, welcome to our town. Um, Accessible 360 is a court certified auditing company. I'll get into what we do, but this is meant for all of you. Um, with this disclaimer, not a coder, not techie. I got one guy on my client development team that's a little bit of one, but that's not what we're here to do today. We're here to solve and talk about a lot of the issues for your clients, how to help them, how to lead your agencies, and also the opportunity for your agencies and for all of you developers, because accessibility is not going away. This is not a fad. This is not like a thing. It isn't going anywhere. Remember responsive web design? So eight years ago, I remember selling digital advertising and nothing fit right on the screens. Maybe it was more than eight years ago. I don't know. Don't quote me. Um, but thank you. Uh, and then uh, responsive web design came about, right? And so none of you people would ever consider designing anything that isn't mobile first. And hopefully after our talk today, you will think twice at least, if not never uh, plan or develop anything that isn't accessible for every human being. So it isn't hard. It's just new. I want you to ask a ton of questions. Um, this is my team up here uh, that will be downstairs right after lunch uh, too when we go down. You're kind of in two locations, so we'll be down there if you want to come up, ask some questions, have us test some things one-on-one, -on -one, anything you don't want to ask in a big group, but there's really no dumb questions. I've been asked all kinds of things, and I teach continuing legal ed on this topic, and lawyers ask a lot of interesting questions as well. So um, just a quick little bit about me. I'm actually from Minneapolis. How many are here from Minneapolis? Woo, shout out. OK. Um, who is a, wait, hold on. Let me get to my fun screen here. Middle. I have a middle button. I'm clicking it, sir. That's all right. Oh, keyboard setup. Continue. See? Oh, just go ahead and text out. <laughs> Bam. Yay. Yay, tech guy. OK. So I just want to take a quick second and get a good feel for who's in the room. Um, so we have a little bit of the Minneapolis contingency over here. You guys should spread out, uh, shed the love. I am a 612-er. So I'm, when we say in Minneapolis or I'm from Minneapolis, I mean, no, I really live in Minneapolis. I'm not one of those suburban types. So no offense to any suburban types in the room. Um, born and raised here uh, in Minnesota. I have three children. I've got a son who works in technology and uh, the restaurant business, uh, both of those things. Um, and then I have twin daughters. They are uh, 19 years old, so they're in their sophomore year. Uh, your prior speaker was in the Air Force. I was the one that thanked him for his service. I happen to have one who's at the Air Force Academy. So she will be maybe flying F-15s, which is kind of crazy. So, you know, you think about, he talked a lot about how things have changed. And when he uh, entered the Air Force, obviously there wasn't an opportunity for her. So, yeah. Go force. Um, my other daughter is a journalist at the University of Minnesota studying journalism, and she writes uh, sports for the paper. Again, kind of another cool thing for women. So, all right, this talk's not about women. Um, let's um, 
talk about accessibility in the digital age. We start, use a very simple uh, definition when we're introducing this concept, and that's just simply the inclusive practice of removing barriers to prevent interaction with websites, mobile apps, software systems, kiosk, internet of things. We do audit all those things. Um, and we started with websites. We knew it would go to mobile apps. We knew eventually we'd be working on enterprise systems. And all those things happened about in the last four years. This is a picture of our group. You might recognize where we are for you local people. Where do we work? In Uptown, right? That's where, yeah. So this mural behind us is on this huge building in Uptown called the Rainbow Building. And this is actually a year ago. Um, you'd have to dump in probably another 10, I think, people of us. So growing really rapidly. We are a collection um, of ex-agency people. So um, one of my co-founders is a gentleman named Mark Lasik. He is well known in this town and across a lot of different agencies. He invented frequent flyer miles. So any of you benefiting from any loyalty programs, you can thank uh, one of my co-founders, Mark Lasik. He's exited from several agencies, including the Lasik Group. Uh, Denali was rolled up into Olson, one of the largest sales on record in the agency world. And then our CTO, Kelly Heikola, ran a mobile app development company called Code Row. And I would say that, and they wouldn't argue, our other most notable co-founder is a gentleman named Aaron Cannon. Aaron Cannon was born blind, became a full stack web developer, software engineer, worked at the nerdery. Just the blind guy, the blind coder. And then this whole thing about accessibility started to rustle up. And he's been working in this field full time since 2017, but obviously, er, 2007, excuse me, but obviously a stakeholder for most of his life in technology. So let's talk about why we do this. How many people is this? I get all kinds of questions. Well, you know, I don't know how many blind people use my site. Well, of course you don't, because there's no way to test, right? You don't know, just like if you know they're coming from iOS or Android, you don't know if they're coming on to one of your digital properties that you create with um, an assistive technology. But it is a large group of people. These are old census numbers. I'm actually working on a presentation for Minnesota High Tech Association in about two weeks, and we're using new census numbers, and that jumps quite a bit. It jumps to 25% of Americans uh, have a disability. Um, that's over 56 million people just in our country. This is not just about people who are currently disabled, it's about the aging baby boomer population, right? We've never had a whole group of human beings absolutely dependent and hooked on this. And so there are things that you guys need to start thinking about now as you build for the future and yourselves, or for me, right? Um, so there are 10,000 baby boomers uh, turning 65 every day. We'll have 71 by 2030. One in 10 men are colorblind. Anybody want to admit to that? Oh, well, there's four of you that are, no. Um, <laughs> one in three family members have at least one person with a disability. Uh, and the spending power of those people with disabilities, their family and friends, represents about $544 billion annually. So please understand that these people have money to spend. They want to spend it on your clients' websites or your websites, your apps, your clients' apps. Um, and we should not be excluding them from that opportunity. The need for website accessibility, I'll hit a couple of high points here, and I do have a tremendous amount of like takeaways and tips in this uh, presentation plan for you today too. The number one place where I'd want you to pay attention is HR portals. It is against the law, regardless of digital accessibility, to discriminate against anybody in the hiring practice. Anybody fill out a paper application lately for a job? No, it's all digital, has been for years. We have to make sure that those HR portals are accessible. Digital accessibility is already required by law in medical, education, and government. So if you're building anything right now in one of those three business verticals, they're already required by law, and they have been since 1998. And I will give you some tips to walk them uh, through that process, because I will tell you a lot of medical, government, and education clients may not even really realize that they must do this. It's not an option. They have to do it. Therefore, you have to do it. Uh, aging workforce, again, and the general public is really demanding um, accessibility. So assistive technologies, there are a bunch out there. Um, understand that there's nothing you do to a website or to an app after it's built 
um, to make it accessible for people. You build accessibility in from the ground up. They come to those digital products with their own assistive technologies. So the one that looks like a little laptop is a refreshable braille display. Over in the right hand corner, that's an eye retinal uh, mouse. So if you can't use a mouse like I see uh, us here using or a mouse tracker, one option is to use an eye, rec eye recognition and literally going through each keystroke with an eye movement and a blink. Fascinating. Um, physical disabilities might require a stylus and a mouth if you are paralyzed or have a uh, spinal cord injury and you're again moving through those keystrokes a little bit more manually obviously than we do. And then a couple of big logos up there, JAWS and VDA. NVDA just passed JAWS in the market share and we're shocked because JAWS was like 80%. For people who are blind, they use screen reader technology, right? Where the DOM is read to them uh, and uh, they can navigate through websites and apps. So just keep in mind that the main things um, about assistive technology, even in your own iPhone or your own Android phone, I invite you to take a look, turn on some of these. When I first met Aaron, he turned on uh, voiceover and your screen goes black on your iPhone and as a joke, he um, purposefully did not turn it off for me. And so I was frantic because I couldn't make my phone work. Um, he plays those little jokes on people a lot. But built into um, your assistive technology, when I do teach continuing legal ed, I ask the lawyers kind of as an icebreaker, hey, does anybody here know how to make the font larger on their phone? And of course, you'll always get one or two attorneys be like, yeah, I know how to do that. It's like, awesome, you have entered the accessibility zone, right? So there's a couple cool things. If you have older parents and they happen to have an iPhone like my 85-year-old parents, we can talk a little bit later about the kid in Cross Lake, Minnesota who sold my parents those iPhones five years ago because if I find them, I think I'll kill them. Um, he taught them how to text. He put them uh, on Twitter. He gave them a Facebook account. I think my dad paid him a little under the table. And they just started texting and were out into the digital world when they were 80. Um, and all six of us kids were just a little taken aback. So um, the things inside the phone, one thing that's really cool though, if you turn on a magnifier and you have an old home button, if you hit that three times, you can magnify things. It's a really easy way if menus are shrinking for you and you don't want to wear readers. So there's a one little tip. You can just kind of pull out your phone and just kind of casually gas over, you know, graze over the menu. So um, that's a cool tip. This is a screen reader demo from Aaron and I'm going to play it just for a minute. Have, has anybody in the room um, experienced JAWS before, a screen reader. Okay, a couple of you, great. So bear with me, it's on the Cheesecake Factory, it takes a little bit, but I just want everyone to get just a little imprint in their mind about um, the, uh, about the uh, screen reader. So hold on one second. Where'd my screen reader go, hold on. Last night I found an app called TikTok. Anybody heard of that? <laughs> My 19 year olds are freaking out. I sent them one. <laughs> Come on people. This is not Aaron. Sorry, hold on. Why am I having so much trouble there? Let's go back. And we're not getting sound. Shoot. <laughs> that is not Aaron though either. Hey, you keep going. I'm skipping. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's not getting sound. It goes through the. Told you I wasn't techie. I don't know why that's not pulling through. Well, we'll play it in a little bit. Five of you heard it. Um, I don't want to waste any more time with that. We'll, we'll play that later. I'll try and pull it up afterwards. I'm not sure why that's not working. I've got a couple of other really cool videos of a refreshable Braille display and different things like that. And we'll uh, make our deck available after. If you haven't seen how a refreshable Braille display works or how JAWS or MBDA works, I really encourage you um, to listen to that because usually I bring one of our auditors and they play it live. Um, and when they first turn it on, it's incredibly, incredibly fast, right? They listen to it at 550 words per minute. And then when Aaron starts to play it, it's really funny because he's like, oh, hold on. And then he hits the slower key and it's like slower, 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 slower. And then he's like, can you guys all hear? So it's incredibly, um, imagine coding, imagine developing something where you're listening to your code constantly. That's what our auditors can do, and that's why they can help you understand how to make your product successful for your clients. So I'm going to jump back out here to presentation mode, and we'll keep going through. I think this is the first time I've never been able to have that play, which is pretty ironic. Um, so let's talk about the law. Um, this is an area where I have a lot of deep, deep knowledge. I am not an attorney. My parents wanted me to be one, and it's pretty ironic that now I teach continuing legal ed. So whenever I go do that, I make sure my dad and my mom, who are 85, get a text or a tweet about that. So um, there's a nomenclature out there, or there's a pattern of speech called ADA compliance. It's not a good one, and I tried to fight it years ago, and then I just let the tidal wave take it. It's wrong because there's nothing within the ADA, any, there's no language within the ADA um, to date that says you must make digital products accessible. There's this law called the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and that's the law that has something in it that talks about digital compliance. But nobody runs around saying Rehabilitation Act compliance, right? So what we're talking about with the ADA, though, you can see in the middle, um, the World Wide Web Consortium is the uh, W3C, the group that gives us um, the, uh, lots of great things, give, gives you developers a lot of great things. But also about 20 years ago, they started the uh, accessibility initiative, and th they've had guidelines out for a very long time. They are called the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. We apply the same success criteria to mobile apps um, as best we can, and we also do it with Internet te Technology. So we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics later. Um, but the Americans with Disabilities Act on the right-hand side, a couple of key points. There's five titles. I'm going to focus on Title I, II, and III. Title I, again, is employment. You cannot discriminate on the basis of employment, so make sure all digital applications, pre-employment screenings and all that type of stuff work if you're working on any of those. Think about it at your own agencies if you're more than 15 uh, people, right? Title III, places of public accommodation. This is the part where they are, this is what the plaintiff attorneys are using. So when they write a demand letter or they file a suit, they are claiming that the internet is a place of public accommodation. Kind of hard to argue with that, right? What's a more public space than the World Wide Web? So um, they say that if a person cannot access that place of public accommodation, you are thus in violation of Title III of the Americans with Disabilities Act. They filed the majority of these cases in uh, California for an additional reason, the UNRWA Act. It allows them to have $4,000 per incident and in penalties. So they like to file in states where they have you know, um, a lot more uh, muscle behind them. They're also filed in New York, Texas, and Miami, uh, well, in, and in Florida, and along the eastern seaboard. They are filed in district courts. There's 11 district courts around the nation. We happen to be in the eighth district court here, kind of the grasslands, right? Kind of the flyover zone, whatever. Um, we've been able to duck a lot of this, but it doesn't matter where your company is located. You can have a case filed in any because, of course, you can access an uh, internet or an app anywhere. So this is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. And this is what I want to point out for success criteria testing. Again, two types of clients out there. One type of client that you might develop for or work for or, um, is a, an organization that is already required by law to meet these requirements, and they have been since 1998. 
And the reason is because there were two amendments made to this law, and they required first the government, that's Section 508. I bet you if I had asked earlier if anybody heard of Section 508, you probably would have heard of it, right? So Section 508 required the government to uh, make their Electronic and Information Technology, EIT, that's probably an acronym you don't use anymore, right? I don't use it anymore. Um, and then Section 504, if you got funding for your uh, organization or your activity from the federal government, you were required also. And that's where medical comes in, because of Medicaid and Medicare. But then when the um, Affordable Care Act went in, that was also part of it. So K through 12 schools and any college or university that accepts FAFSA, right, that would be a public education uh, entity. Um, so public education, healthcare, and government. So here's what, uh, let, me go back, let me go back to the uh, Title III entities though. Um, they're the ones that are all getting sued. <laughs> Nobody's suing the government, right? There's a new law uh, put into place uh, December, or Jan, let's see, December 20th of 2018. Uh, President Trump enacted the 21st Century IDEA Act. And what that act is gonna do is it's gonna enforce the fact that government's supposed to be accountable for digital accessibility and they have to start reporting. So it's not a new law about digital accessibility, it's a new law requiring reporting about the law that they already were supposed to be doing, okay? A big study in 2017, 85% uh, of the most visited federal government websites not at all accessible. And they were given the mandate in 1998. So government kind of moves like this, right? Um, okay, so places of public accommodation, those are your clients that are probably all getting targeted. A uh, couple of fads, a couple of trends. So uh, Connor Bourne, member of my team, not sitting over there right now, I think he's downstairs on a call. He actually pulls these court systems every Tuesday um, out of the um, PACER system. It's a federally, uh, uh, publicly available court system. It's not accessible and it's horrible to use. Um, but any lawsuit that's filed in a district court is placed in there. And so we know if any of your clients might have gotten sued, we might know before your clients, we can give you a heads up. It's a very sticky situation, especially if you just launched a website for them. So we're really good at helping you through that too. Um, here's, what's ha here's what happens if this happens to a client. They might get a demand letter or they might get um, a lawsuit filed right away. There are a couple of plaintiff firms out there that will send a demand letter. If you do nothing, they'll send you another one six months later. That trend is really basically Carlson Lynch um, out of Pennsylvania. Most of the other plaintiff attorneys are just gung-ho at it. There's a guy, I think I educated him, fortunately, on a phone call a couple years ago, graduated law school, two years later had sued 520 uh, companies, making quite a living out of this cottage industry. The next comments I'm gonna make are personal, although pretty much everybody at our company feels the same way and everybody in our industry. Uh, plaintiff attorneys are invoicing companies, okay? They're not, in my humble opinion, trying to make the world more accessible. They, plaintiff attorneys by nature do this. Any plaintiff attorneys in the room, sorry, but that's the, you know, that's the business model, right? So if you get one of these from one of your clients um, or they get the threat of it or you wanna warn them against it, let them know there's some tactics we can take together um, and things that I'll teach you to do on behalf of your clients to mitigate that risk. Um, number one, if you work with a big corporation, talk to them if they ask you about this top topic to uh, consider drafting a policy of digital inclusivity. A lot of companies have an inclusivity policy. A lot of them have an EEOC policy. The part they're missing is the digital part. That's a great suggestion that you can add into the conversation. They should post an accessibility statement on their webpage. I'll give you a couple easy brands to remember or write down. Dairy Queen, Room and Board, um, Culver's, trying to think of like local kind of national brands that you could see. Any of the Kardashian families, you can go to their sites. You'll also see our badge on these sites, but you'll see a really succinct accessibility statement. And again, as we go down to lunch, we'll have a couple computers open and you can see those. A really good accessibility statement should be reviewed by their internal legal team, and it should contain these four things. They have a goal of being accessible to everyone. They have taken actions and they can list maybe one action, <laughs> like we're getting help. <laughs> um, they should be open to feedback. 
and they should express that they have an ongoing um, commitment to this, right? So they need to have a phone number on there, an email marked up correctly, an alternative way to get help if they're struggling. Do not encourage, or if you ever see accessibility statements where a client wants to write out everything that you might have tested, do not do that. <laughs> Less is more here. Do not be specific. Um, the other thing is, uh, they could, um, we would advise them to maybe uh, designate an accessibility coordinator. Not a full-time job. I'd add one to your agency. If you guys are from an agency, I would consider adding somebody to it or a committee. And the reason is, is because all of these tactics are a defense mechanism, right? So um, recovering jock, uh, sports fan, uh, your best defense is a super strong offense. And so by way of your clients, the best thing you can do for them is give them these solid recommendations as well. Um, invest in technical training for developers and marketers. Uh, engage independent approved vendor for a live user audit. We'll talk about what makes us a good vendor, but I'll also talk about what makes a good vendor if you don't ever work with us. Because I want you to stay away from the things that are gonna get you into trouble, waste your firm's money, and maybe put your client at risk. Um, you should uh, seek a letter of conformance or a VPAT. We'll talk about those in a minute. And then continue to monitor websites. That's what they typically agree to. So. The good, bad, and the ugly. Um, the good, I would say, you know, there's agencies um, partnering with A360 definitely see an increase in their income to their bottom lines. If you embrace this new competency, this new skill, your income to your agency or to yourself personally will increase. You will be in still a very small group across the nation. Um, those that have um, their head in the sand would uh, probably be the bad, right? Don't ignore this, like I said in my opening remarks. So the good is agencies that partner with us help their clients, they reduce their risk, and they're increasing the incomes for their agencies or themselves. Uh, the bad is the, part, is the people that have their head in the sand. Uh, the ugly is this, don't go too far. You need to know what you don't know, and you should never impersonate an accessibility auditor. Always have disclaimers on. I have seen agencies be countersued when their clients were sued. I have seen documents where agencies say that we say that this is W or that this is WCAG 2.0 level AA compliant, and they ran one of the free school uh, scanning tools through, or another uh, about as equally good scanning tool that they happen to pay for through it. Don't be putting letters of conformance together for clients unless you have the type of insurance that a court certified auditing company does. It's a huge risk. So, uh, talked about W3C. Most of you are probably familiar. How many have uh, read through the, w, uh, the WK guidelines? I would guess the majority of you guys, right? kind of dry, it would make a hell of a lot more sense to you guys than it did to me when I first read it. <laughs> so um, four main areas, perceivable, oper uh, operable, understandable, uh, and robust. We have a little sizing issue there. So let's talk about why those four guidelines help these types of people. Four different types of disabilities. These are the same four disabilities that are um, called out in the Americans with Disabilities Act. They're the same four that the WK guidelines address. So we need to make sure that people that have vision disabilities, physical, cognitive, or auditory, can interact in an equitable manner with everything digital that you create. Here's a couple of quick things. There's very few cognitive guidelines. I think there should be a couple more. Uh, don't let uh, form fields time out and don't use flash advertising or you know, flash banners. So again, a couple old things. They're working on some new cognitive ones. Auditory is pretty easily solved, and here's why. If you're gonna play a movie, Vimeo, um, iTunes, Bright uh, Cove, uh, 3D Media Player, all those, they've really fixed the whole accessibility issue about getting closed captioning on. Make sure if you're helping clients, to uh, their default settings should be on, on closed close captioning on. And then the other thing is, understand that you have to have a way for everybody to navigate to that movie play it, pause it, and escape from it. So that comes, uh, then we get into keyboard only navigation, which is the physical. So it's not just about throwing closed captioning on. If you don't pay attention to the navigation part of it, then that video could play constantly in somebody's ear, and that's annoying, right? And they'll, they'll leave whatever site or app they're in, right? So visual and physical are the two areas that we deal the most in. They're the two areas that you will deal the most in in regards to the guidelines. 
Keep in mind, visual disabilities are people that might just need a larger font. Uh, they might be colorblind, although nobody wants to admit that here. Um, and then they might also um, be completely blind, right, and they're using a, a screen reader. So a wide range of disabilities in there. Um, color contrast. I forgot to ask in the beginning, who's the designer? Fancy people. Okay, we have a handful of fancy people. So digital accessibility should come into play um, with what you're doing as well. Minimum uh, color contrast at font requirements, different things like that. Being careful of the color yellow. <laughs> right, right. I mean, you guys probably already know that. But anyway, um, four disabilities within there, and those are the four we're dealing with. This is a really great slide to go a little bit deeper into the uh, what are the requirements. So people like to say this, um, the guidelines are so unclear. Nobody knows what accessibility is. That's lawyers talking, that's judges talking. You guys know what it is. This international standard, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, it's been out 20 years. We use it in every business vertical that we uh, do audits in and we use it in every single country. Here's a little insider tip. Every other first world country already has WCAG 2.0 level AA written in to their version of uh, disability, uh, the, the ADA. We are the only country that does not have a law that specifically calls out the requirement for this. Since 2015, if you built a website in Canada, you would have had to meet this due to the Ontario uh, Accessibility Act. And the UK and the EU are now starting to actually enforce the laws that they have on the books. So here's the thing in the UK, and I'm about to teach with some uh, two um, British attorneys, and I can't wait to see what happens because over there, on the, across the pond, they're still so hypersensitive about GDPR, right? It's all about the cookies, right? And that's all they could talk about when they were here a couple years ago. I've stayed in contact with them, and now they're thinking about this enforcement that, that's coming through the EU and the UK about digital accessibility. They've had the law, you know, the law has been there, it's been on the books, but they don't have the atmosphere that we do here. They don't have the litigious society that we do here in the United States. People don't go around suing other people over there all the time um, for a couple of different reasons, but they're gonna start uh, enforcing this and paying attention to it too. 2.1, any questions on 2.1? It came out last summer, 17 additional tests, Everything that's in 2.0 is in 2.1. There's 12 additional tests for level AA, and it's mostly about um, mobile. So just trying to increase, um, keep up with technologies, right? The faster and more beautiful things that you guys build, they need to keep up with some additional tests. I will tell you of over our 600 clients, we do not have more than 5% working on 2.1 right now. Everybody's still trying to get to 2.0. So it's out there. Um, but there's 12 additional tests. We don't push companies to audit to it because it's just driving up the cost, right? So we focus on getting to 2.0 first. Okay, now I have about three or four slides from my tech team and this is about the limit of my tech. What they would like you to know is this. The number one rule of website accessibility, I was gonna ask the question, but it's in your HTML. So we want to make sure that you give a good foundation. If it's done correctly, your HTML is your workhorse to offering accessibility. I know a lot of you don't like to do it. I have heard things like it's not really programming. Um, mark up, make sure that you do this because your HTML is the part that connects your content to everyone and so please give it the attention that it deserves. Number two, rule of website accessibility. Label everything. Rule 2.5, <laughs> label it. <laughs> Rule three, I wanna talk about ARIA, accessible rich internet applications. So, uh, never use uh, ARIA when the desired accessible outcome is possible with HTML. Really be careful about ARIA. One of the first things we do as the client development team is if we go to a person's website and we see a whole bunch of ARIA on it, we know somebody's Googled something, been in one chat room, got one tip, and then went crazy. This stuff is dangerous. And what you don't know is that you are unfortunately making it worse for screen readers. You should use ARIA when you, as a last resort. It should never be the go-to, and Aaron has this saying. Uh, 
Aria is like salt, right? Every recipe needs a certain amount of it. You use too much Aria and even your dog won't eat what you made. It renders the digital product absolutely useless and inaccessible. And I can't tell you how many national brands, big, big companies, how many times a day we pull up a website and there's 258 Aria on the homepage. So if you're doing this, this would be the first thing that they would like you to stop. Go back to your basics. Um, lastly, everybody likes a DIY project, right? I love DIY projects, my husband hates them. Um, so when you go back to um, your computers, when you go back to any sites, when you're messing around with anything that you're building, put your mouse away and see how far you get through the user experience with your keyboard. Even us non-techie client development people do this all the time for clients. This is a great place to start. If you are working on an e-commerce site and you can't find a pair of jeans, pick a size and a color wash and put it in your cart and check out, then neither can millions of other people who would like to buy those products from your clients. So that's your little DIY. Um, specify the focus indicators when you're developing. Document the focus order during planning. Uh, imagine tab tabbing through each design with a keyboard are the tips that my technical team wanted you guys to really think about. So let's go to, um, we have just a, uh, how many minutes left? Let me do a time check. Awesome, okay, great. So becoming digitally, accessibili uh, digitally accessible. This is where I tell you what not to do, what to stop wasting your time on, what's okay to do, how to get by if you don't have the budget or the client doesn't have the budget. This is really where all your takeaway stuff is. Number one, live user audits. It's the only way to test for accessibility. The United States government has had a statement out on this for years. It's not arguable. You can test some things with SAS, and what you can test with SAS is about 20 or 25% of the WK guidelines. I'll show you an independent study on the next slide. Number two, other so-called solutions, an add-on application or, a, um, or overlay tools. If I was as clever as the first speaker, I'd have some kind of like Star trek -y reference to this, but I'm not into Star Trek, I'm sorry. So maybe I can pull one from him over lunch. I call it the Harry Potter method of website accessibility. You cannot drop something over this amazing thing that you built and for $900 or $295 or with one piece of JavaScript, make the thing accessible. Just stop and think about that for a moment. It doesn't work. Things like, and I'll name them, things like AudioY, the overlay tools, all that crap, it doesn't work. We are a court certified auditing company. I have audited all of them. In every single incidence that I've audited them, that our company has audited them. They have either made the experience worse, not worked. The actual icons on the accessibility tools do not meet color contrast. They're not marked up correctly. They don't have focus indicator. It's a joke. Stay away from that stuff. It makes people feel good to see something. I have people say, show me a site before and show me one after. <laughs> yeah. Are they visible in court? Great question. No, they are not. Uh, there is a case with Scandinavian um, Airlines, um, and there are a couple of other uh, court cases coming up where those have been tested. We have been involved, I can tell you the ones that we've been publicly involved in. So the company called Barbary, spin off of Thomson Reuters, they make a digital uh, testing tool for lawyers. And this gets really good attention when I'm teaching uh, continuing legal ed. They used a thing, uh, number three, a so-called separate but equal site. There's companies out there that tell you that, oh, just sign up here and we'll just convert it and then it'll work for them, those other people. Doesn't work. First of all, it's a huge civil rights risk in my opinion. We had a time in our country where we put people through one door and other people through another door. If you engage in this activity, that's literally what you're doing. You are saying, through this digital door, we'll have people that are like us and then we'll send everybody else through a different digital door. Don't do it. Um, the, that one, um, we actually had an audit that other so-called separate but equal site that unfortunately they had paid a few hundred thousand dollars for wasn't accessible. We had to share our audit report and we had to help them fix it in the time being because they had a test to put up. Uh, all the overlay tools, all that kind of stuff. We came across a lot of the overlay tools and um, some of that other stuff, uh, the, down, the downloadable things um, with uh, banks. So 40% of community banks were sued a couple years ago, and in some states, 100% of credit unions. So 
We know a lot about that stuff. Stay away from it. Um, now, can you use a little bit of SAS? Yes, you can use a little bit of SAS. We have SAS too. We have a scanning tool. Everybody has a scanning tool. Scanning tool, this is a great independent study. Um, there's probably some over here on the left-hand side that you guys have installed that you're working. You might have a, a Wave Chrome plugin. We all have one too. Wave is great. Here's the deal. They built a website and they put in uh, 143 known accessibility issues and they run all the scanning tools through. I think they still do this. They were doing it like every quarter or twice a year. Here's the results. Those scores over there aren't out of 100%. They're out of the 20 or 25 that you can scan for. So if you think that because you have no errors on the wave tool or because site improve doesn't show anything, understand what you're saying. You are saying that based on its ability to check 20 or 25 percent of the weak Hague success criteria that can be scanned for, that's the score. Now, the reason I call out wave is it's free. It's got a really good user interface. It's from the University of Utah. It's from a, you know, a foundation at the University of Utah. It's fine. Scan it. Learn some stuff. It's got great intel in it. But it's not a full test for accessibility at all. And if you don't get any errors in the wave tool, it doesn't mean what you've built is accessible. Think about this for just a quick second. A scanning tool uh, for text, uh, alt text right, on an image to describe an image, you could have one, two, three, four, five, six in that alt text. Scanning tool says, yep, there's an alt text. Super simple um, explanation of why you need humans in there to test. So how we test with humans. This is how we do it. Um, we're known for being kind of the Jillian Michaels in the website accessibility. I don't mind that title. I like it. Um, a lot of the other stuff is kind of like diet pills, right? So I re correlate a lot of things in accessibility to fitness. Every single day, people are getting either more accessible or less accessible on their website, depending on what new things they do to it. What we do is we pair a blind accessibility engineer with one or two sighted. They start on the home page, for example, for, from web page. On the home page, they'll identify all site-wide issues. And then they work through the website the exact same way it was built, off of the templates. We do not charge our clients to audit every single page. It's fiscally immoral. What they will, we will find the accessibility issues in the templates. So when we scope a project, if you're thinking of a client or you're building something now, the way that my guys and I would, would scope this is we want to know what's on the home page. We'd love to know your code stack, you know, interesting things like that. Then we want an example of each template that's in use and maybe two samples of it if, say, you've got a table on one but a form filled on that, tablet, on that template. We just want to experience every type of thing that you have and then we'll audit it. We will tell you exactly where the accessibility issues are, which guidelines are not being met, and then we will tell you um, a custom recommended fix. We have built that what we think of is the only fully accessible work ticketing system out there in the world. So JIRA, Basecamp, right, managing your workflow. We have a bunch of blind auditors. Those didn't work. So the first thing we did was built from the ground up a fully accessible work ticketing system. It's awesome. It has a really good interface, and it's fully accessible. So if you have an opportunity to work with us, and we'd love to do this, is you'll be working side by side with our blind and sighted accessibility engineers in that work ticketing system. We have our own GitHub version of code. We've done thousands and thousands of audits. So you're putting in an image carousel. You're going to use Slick Slider. Great, open source. We fixed it. Here's the code. There is a very fast way to get your clients accessible if you work with somebody who does the majority of this work. Um, our, so the first step is um, assess it, right? Audit it. We diagnose what's wrong. Then um, the proper uh, next step is to give you a treatment protocol. Here's how to fix it. When we're done with an audit, we give you two deliverables. One's a technical blueprint report for you guys. Then we give you this awesome other report where you can walk into any company meeting um, and the C-suite can understand it, right? Here's the three or four things we've, we're working on with our vendor. Um, here's the 30,000 foot level. We put some pictures in there for them. Helps them understand what you guys are doing. So clients as well. It's a great client facing report. And then the whole idea is to maintain it afterwards. This is a screenshot of our accessibility hub. 
um, again, we invite you to look at it. We all have it open uh, on our computers down there. Um, we can show you around in there, show you how you can put in your sprints, how you can map your um, IDs, how you can uh, parse issues out to different members of your team and assign them. You can filter all different ways. You can imagine a bunch of developers writing a new ticketing system. It's got a lot of fun stuff in there that you guys would like to use. Um, this is an example of an exported report. So if you export it, you could upload it into JIRA or Basecamp. It's in CSV. You could do it that way. Here's something I want to talk about. The other way to, to work with us, I'll kind of quickly go through the rest of this, and then, like I said, we'll continue downstairs with any questions or anything. Um, but if you're building a new design, reach out to, um, to a vendor that is qualified to do this for you. Um, and have them review your designs. Have them review your flat design files. Get accessibility in early. Then we'll, uh, they can help you or we would love to help you as you're building through, right? So a lot of times we don't get called until the purple area. That is not good. Now, um, the reason because it's much more expensive and more difficult and disruptive to your um, development uh, time frame to have us go in and start have you go back and fix things. So the analogy I use is put your outlets in, you know, before the sheetrock goes up, right? Get accessibility in beforehand, get testing going beforehand. This is um, a process, if you're developing with a platform company, we have a whole process for those, right, and how to help their end clients. I'm not going to go through that right now. But a path to an agency partner with A360 really looks like this. We'd love you to, to get through a couple of design reviews. We'd love you to get through a couple of audits. And then um, the income uh, path will switch a little bit. You should, in all of your proposals, I think do this right now. I'm trying to get to the takeaways before you run out of time. In all of your proposals, if I were you, I would take this approach. I would say that you guys develop, we develop to meet WCAG uh, 2.0 level AA. If you do not want this product to meet accessibility guidelines and offer equitable access to everyone, check this box. I wouldn't line item the cost for accessibility because it's way too easy for clients to say no or get out of it. And then it's not in there and it should go into everything. So I would take the assumptive and I would just say, check this box if you don't want it to. The other reason I say that is to protect your agencies, right? If a client says they don't want it to meet, they can never come back to you and say it is. VPAT, any questions on VPAT? Anybody know what a VPAT is? I have a funny story to tell you. So there's a couple of guys that wrote the VPAT requirements back in, I don't know, the 80s or 90s. I was in DC and we were at this big round table and I made the offhanded comment, which if you get to know me would not surprise you at all. And I said, well, the VPAT's a box checking exercise. And this guy leans over and he says, yeah, I didn't really mean that when I, when I wrote it. I didn't intend it to be that when I wrote it. Ooh. So Ken Slates, great guy, super, uh, we still have a relationship. He actually used A360 to, we beta tested the new 2.0 version. Here's the difference between a VPAT and a letter of conformance. A VPAT's kind of like taking your kid to the doctor for the physical, for sports, right? They probably never eat, they just kind of eyeball them and they're like, yep, looks good, you can play football. So it's meant to be, um, you can answer in a VPAT, yes, this meets it, no, it doesn't, or it sort of meets it. So it's kind of the good, bad, and ugly of a product. But as long as you have a VPAT done, it's a box checking exercise. Your RFP submission for, say, a government or medical or school is going to continue down the path because you have a VPAT. But a VPAT's not a letter of conformance. A letter of conformance is more like a bill of health. So, is that, you understand the difference there? We do VPATs for companies all the time, we do them for agencies all the time. And again, it's to slide the risk over. We're a court certified auditing company. If you, build something for government, healthcare, or education, you fill out a VPAT and there's an error in it, they can come back to you. That's a big problem. There's a huge case in California right now. It's a, called a QUITAM case. And it's about using federal tax dollars to build something that was supposed to meet certain requirements and now it doesn't. That's a big mess you don't want to go down. So VPAT, if you need them, we can do them. You can do them yourself. A VPAT stands for Voluntary Product Accessibility Template. Clients can fill it out themselves, really. Um, anybody can fill it out. If you're comfortable, go ahead. If you want a little bit of help, get some help. But understand that it's not a letter of conformance. 
That's a very slow loading slide. Okay, so here's some key takeaways. Um, these are good things to take back and just talk about, I think, within your groups. There's a real business case for digital accessibility. We talked about the social reason. There's a technical reason. It gets everything that you're built ready for the next iteration, right? Um, and then financial, much, much lower web development or mobile app development cost if you do it early. Um, and then the legal ramifications. So four really good solid business cases for it. I would say trust but verify is a great takeaway. Ensure the products you're incorporated have a solid foundation for clients. Don't rely on automated testing tools, but if that's all you can do, then just understand where the limits are and, and start using them. If you're not doing any of it, start there. If you have a little bit of questions, then reach out. I understand that not every client's gonna be able to go you know, the full Monty, right? They, they can't afford it, it wasn't in it, but start building what you can in, and again, start with your HTML. Um, we have a saying at A360, nothing about us without us, and that's just our mantra. If you want to know if something you know, is usable by somebody who's blind, ask somebody who's blind. You know, that kind of that methodology. Accessibility is ongoing. So making digital products accessible should be viewed as a process, not a one-time project. So do what you can with the clients that you can going first. I will tell you there's a very, very, very small number of developers and designers that have this competency. And if you develop it, what happens with our partner agencies is we're shoving you business because we don't compete with you. We don't do the remediation. We don't want to build anything new for them. We're all done with that now. We just do this. We're a subcontractor to the agency. That's our best and highest use. Um, it is a growth area for everyone. One of the other things we're really super good at um, with clients and, and with clients C-suite is explaining why an agency didn't have accessibility built in. It's new to everybody. Um, we bring that fresh you know, um, kind of context to those tough um, situations. Because I bet right now some of you are thinking, oh, I just launched something in, you know, for a hospital or I just launched something for a clinic or I'm building this and it's not. Doesn't matter, it can all be fixed. It's new to everyone. We explain it's not taught in school. Anybody go to a coding school and learn about accessibility on a deep level? No, <laughs> it's new to everyone. So um, that's what we try and help people understand. And then third party players. Here's a really super, super good takeaway. If you have a client asking what they should do about the third party elements and plugins that you're putting into a website or app, talk to them about these three things. They should choose when they negotiate their contract with that third party provider, the chat provider, you know, the you know, redirect, the you know, whatever it is, the shopping cart, whatever you're putting in. Um, there's three different ways in law to convey that. It could be general, specific, or pass through. And again, this slide just gives you that real simple language, but really good tips to talk through about their clients, because once you start talking to them about this, they're gonna start asking more questions. So hopefully I ended a little bit um, on time. Um, at the end, I just have a couple, you know, a couple of things, just ask yourself, you know, is equitable access discussed with your clients? Do you know how to explain its importance? And are you impersonating an auditor? <laughs> Hope not, because we're here to help. So um, if you're building apps for healthcare and wellness, make sure that you're covering that type of stuff. Um, really, really super important. We're, um, for you guys here in Minneapolis, we're right in Uptown. Um, we do a lot of meetups. We do a lot of informal questions, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you just want to have a great sit down, come by. We're right above Chino Latino um, on Lynn, on Lynn and uh, Lake Street. So, or Lake Street in um, Hennepin, sorry, that we moved. Um, platform providers got a lot of other stuff in here. Just going to kind of fly through this stuff again. We'll definitely make our deck available. Um, take this back to your agencies. Any questions? from the agency perspective that you want to ask now, or do you want to just go eat and chat downstairs later? Yeah? One of the things, oh, one of the things, and Valerie can back me up on this, one of the things that we used to sell and you might want to incorporate too is um, ADA compliance works really well with search engine optimization. Oh, yeah. So that's so funny that you say that. Usually I say, do you understand that accessibility is, like there's nothing more you can do, right, for SEO uh, as a basis, yeah. We, we had a VP of uh, our remediation, Peter Qualley, who ran search engine optimization for years. We talk about that all the time, right? But again, here's why we don't talk about that to our clients is because a lot of our agency partners sell that as a service. So it puts us in a little bit of, 
we don't want to take anything away that you're monetizing now. We are a really good vendor. We know our place. We, we kind of stay in our lane. But yeah, super, super valid point. Um, so it, uh, we obviously shouldn't present ourselves as auditors. No. Is there a uh, language that you would recommend that we use um, to say that we are um, uh, aware of trying to be accessible in the environment? Yeah. So how, would, how would you say that in a proposal or in a description of the services we offer? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, well, I think there's a couple of different ways. I think if you have any certifications like the IAAP one, um, it doesn't take long. It's actually not fully accessible, the testing, um, but that's a different story. Um, but if you guys took that, there aren't, so we did it even though the tests our auditors didn't even feel they were worthy of them testing for, but they did it because again, sometimes you just need those labels. So I would get certified in IAAP. I think that would be a great one. Um, And then um, if you collect the things that you've been to, if you, I don't know if you take the time to write papers or stuff on it, but if you just say, you know, we're we're an absolutely informed agency, um, we'll do our best to do this. And then I would add the caveat, if you ever do really need um, a letter of conformance, we certainly can work with, um, you know, an auditing company to get you there. Yep, but tell them what you do. Um, and I would, I'd be careful about the part that when you hand it over to a client, don't talk about what you do if they can wreck it when you give it to them. If their marketing or content editors can wreck stuff, that's the other thing we're really super good at communicating to your end clients. You could do this great thing and we give you a letter of conformance and you hand it off to them and in 10 minutes they've wrecked the, you know. So. Talk about what you can do and then just say, yeah, yeah. So, uh, regarding that, what I, so let's say that the site is great, it's been signed off on and everything, and you can navigate the, you know, navigate yeah. the site and everything, and then on a blog post, a content editor forgets to put an alt tag on, a, uh, on an image. Like, relative risk there, is that, yeah. um, I mean, we, I'm assuming we should put some language in our contracts about, you know, the ongoing content editing and, liability for that and all that, but um, what's the relative risk there? Or I don't know if that's something you can comment on. So here's the funny thing about alt text. Aaron and a lot of my editors will, or auditors will say, there's a reason it's called eye candy. Unless there's an offer in there or a discount coupon, I could utterly care less, I could, skip it. I could skip it. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. They have to listen to everything. Um, and I should, I should try and play that. I'll play that video downstairs for you guys. But here's the thing about risk. of any demand letter or lawsuit, um, they're uh, settled within two days to two months. So the plaintiffs might run a scanning tool through. Now they just seem to make real general accusations. They kind of paraphrase. They're pretty funny. They paraphrase the WeK guidelines and they send every single company the same demand letter. In fact, we, we could play a game, take the name off it, we could tell you which law firm sent that. The odds of getting sued for an alt text is not a reality because I honestly don't think plaintiff attorneys or their marketing teams actually look at websites before they send those things out. If that were to happen, the reality of it is when we get those, sometimes on the first call, we'll sit and walk them through and say, yeah, you know, you don't have alt text on the home page. Could you developers throw those up? Can they get an accessibility statement up? In that interim time when, before you, when you get a demand letter and before they file a suit, there's some things and strategy in there that we will really help you do. Your risk isn't huge if you're missing an alt text. Your risk is bigger if they can't use the site. And that's what we often are in court defending. Like in June, we went to trial with Omni Hotels International. They kept getting sued. The claims weren't valid. And they're not even technically sound or right claims. And Aaron testified and showed, you know, via video how he could do it. It's a... It's kind of a, a juxtaposition in that everybody, it's like proving a negative. It's kind of the situation that you're in. Most websites are not accessible. Fact, you know, most of them don't work for people. Fact. So the demand letter, regardless of how erroneous it is, is correct, even though it's not based on actual research. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I think t- educating your clients about what they do on that front end is really important because that's the part where everybody's looking and scrutinizing and they run some tool through or they, they, everybody runs a different tool through and they get different you know, answers. We don't even deal with any of those tools or anything when we're really involved in litigation. They, have no, they play zero part. Yeah. 
Uh, first off, fantastic presentation. Oh, thank Great you. Um, we have a lot of government and healthcare clients, mm -hmm. and a lot of times clients do really want to do the right thing. Yeah. So in their hearts, they want to do the right thing, and we talk about it sensitively. Yeah. But it always comes down to a budget I know. issue. So I know. Uh, in terms of a project this cost, really like is there a, is there a, what is that, you know, what, like if you were to do it, partnering with you, just as a kind of ballpark, mm -hmm. what would that mean in terms of percentage to add to the cost of project? Here's the beauty of the answer, less over time. My goal is for you guys to do as much of it as you can after you go through projects with us and we're there as backup. That's my ideal. I don't want to drive the cost up for clients. I want to keep all the billing with the agencies. I want to be this subcontractor that goes in and does our niche area. So to answer your question, uh, 10 or 15% of the overall build is a really good number. Okay, so it's just like everybody comes to you, how much for a website? I don't know, what do you want it to do, right? I get the same, same questions. So 10 or 15%, but less over time. I talked about that new design build. Uh, we charge $39.95 to review design files, okay? After you've done several of them and you know what to look for, you charge your client the $39.95 and get us involved just where you need us to do the QA testing. That's the business opportunity that we bring to the table. Again, we're a bunch of ex-agency people. We do not want to compete. We want to work together and support you guys. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. I read a monopoly. Yeah. What, is, what about um, hosting platforms like Shopify? Yeah. Um, what, because you know, you're kind of limited in what you can do. Here's why you got to get to know us. We have a partnership with Shopify, and I'll also tell you the e-commerce platforms that don't work and you should stay away from, but I won't say that out loud here. Um, <laughs> Shopify has a guy now named Scott Venkel, and Scott Venkel is the in-house accessibility coordinator there. We talked to him weekly, just emailed him two days ago. Um, they have a theme called Debut. Start with that, that's a good one. Their Shopify Plus version, the shopping cart, if you don't let your client talk you into putting in all those aftermarket apps, which we're working through right now, you're good to go on the shopping cart. Shopify is an awesome one. Um, we got to them through uh, the Kardashian sisters, to be honest with you. Yeah, we were having trouble, they were on Shopify Plus. Uh, Stillwater Agency, I'll never forget it. Uh, Peter called him probably six months, he was on the chat room on Shopify. Shopify's like, I think something's a miss. <laughs> and again, a lot of other e-commerce platforms know something's amiss and they're not really doing much of it now. Back to my Clint Eastwood side, good, bad, and ugly. I know an e-commerce platform company where we gave the code to to solve one of their versions and every merchant they gave it to, they charged each one of them again instead of just pushing it through in a maintenance upgrade. That makes me sick, but they did it. So, what else? Any other questions? Uh, we're, we're out of time. So. We're out of time. That's but the Mich gone. Michelle will be around, yeah. it sounds like. Oh, so yeah, we're going downstairs. We're going to have lunch, hang out. So, yeah, if, if, if there's something you're building or something you want us to look at or you want to hear the Jaws video that I couldn't get to work earlier, um, we'll be downstairs in the lunchroom. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having us. We're happy to jump in and give you guys some help. So. Thank you very much. Uh, lunch is downstairs uh, in just a couple of minutes, uh, right where we had uh, breakfast. So we'll head down there and uh, we'll meet back here at one o'clock. I think Andy has delusions of grandeur or something like that. So we'll, we'll meet back here to hear about that.